This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. Today, we are going to talk to our senator from the Big Island, and it is big. A Senator Russell Rodeman represents the district of Puna, which of course is all over the map, and everybody around the world is talking about Puna like they know where it is. And so to, to really talk about Puna, what is going on, and what the future holds for Puna, we are going to talk to Senator Russell Rodeman. Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Thank you for having me. How are you? Oh, we're doing wonderful. I am so pleased to talk to you today to talk about Puna and where it is and what is going on. First, tell us about the Senator. Give us a little background about you. Oh, uh, well, I've been, this is my second term in office. You know, before getting elected, I was mostly um, a citizen activist, I would say, and uh, my main area of involvement was uh, always environmental issues. On the side, I own a group of natural food stores here on the Big Island, and uh, my big hobby is playing music. So politics, music, and business, that's my three hats. Oh, wonderful. So now, what kind of a store do you have? Uh, we have a group of three natural foods markets, um, kind of like miniature Whole Foods type stores. Uh, no GMOs? Well, we, we do our best to uh, limit GMOs. We don't add new GMO products. It, it's very difficult to claim no GMOs if you have any packaged foods these days. And, so we and, do our best. Okay, and the name of the store or the store? The name of the store is Island Naturals. Island so have, Naturals Market in uh, Delhi. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And right. where, where are they located? We're in Hilo, Pahoa, and Kailua Kona. Wonderful. But now, so in natural foods, you're trying not to have GMOs. Is that, did I understand that? You know, I don't want to make the discussion about GMOs in natural foods. What we try to do is uh, present healthy, uh, uncontaminated foods. You know, we use organic as much as possible, which means it was grown without most chemical fertilizers or pesticides. So we have healthy whole foods that are honestly labeled. That's the important thing. We do try to avoid GMOs, but I think it's more important, you know, issues like organic, local, healthful are, are more on people's minds these well, days, perhaps. Now tell us, these are locally grown foods? Well, we have as much locally grown foods as we as possible. We always try to increase the amount of locally grown food that we sell. And in our produce department, it's you know maybe sixty percent local. But when you look in the packaged foods department, most of those things still come from the mainland. But now, speaking of locally grown, and I, I guess I'm out of order here, but. Tell us about Puna, then I can get to the question I wanted to ask you about locally grown. How big is Puna? All of the farms and ranches and things that are in that district and now are being forced into looking different because of Madame Pele. So let's tell us about Puna. Well, Puna, uh, you know, uh, it's a very diverse district. It's it's very large. As you mentioned earlier, the Puna district is actually larger than the island of Oahu. Uh, to give some perspective, uh, we have about 45,000 people that live here, which is about the same as the population of Hilo or Kona, although most people don't realize that. Puna is the fastest growing district in our state and the poorest district in our state. And I think those, both of those things relate to the fact that land here is still very affordable compared to the average of Hawaii. So when someone's on a fixed income or someone's looking around the state for a place they can afford, 
East Hawaii and Puna look very attractive because of the cost of land and the cost of housing here. So therefore, a lot of relatively poor people have gravitated here. And, and, and also, that's the reason for the fast-growing nature of it, because it's affordable. So a lot of people couldn't afford life on Oahu moved to, moved to Pahoa and Hilo. It's very, um, it is really beautiful. The whole island well, is beautiful. Thank you so much. Now, of course, right now, we're, the big thing we're facing is this lava flow, which has um, affected about a third of our district and affected some areas very, very greatly. And it's, it's frankly devastating. And I think it's very hard for people outside of our district to understand what it's like. Uh, no, there's no way to know. Uh, if, you know, I've been watching pictures every day and been mesmerized by the flow. It, but, you know, it's still almost impossible to really think of what the people are going through with the, the uh, odor or the sulfur, whatever that is, that comes from the volcano. What about the people that had farms down there, uh, the orchids, the vegetables, uh, the coffee? What about those farmers? What what happens to them? Well, it's a it's a disaster. There's not there's no uh, way of avoiding saying that it's a disaster because for most of the farmers that were affected by this lava flow, they not only have lost their land or the ability to farm their land, but they've lost their income and perhaps their livelihood because it's not easy to just start over when you're a farmer. You know, there's maybe a lead time of at least a year before the crops can produce money. And you have to find new land to farm and get set up with all the equipment and personnel and everything. So it, it's it's devastating. I mean, the, the, one of the things I think people don't understand is most of the folks who've lost their home, many of them have also lost their livelihood. So it's, it's, it's much worse than it might seem. And, of course, this applies to all the farmers who have lost their land. Now, some farms have been inundated, covered by lava. Other farms are inaccessible, and others are not safe to be because of the sulfur dioxide in the air. And in some of those cases, m many of the crops have died already. So it's, it's, it's different categories of people, but their farm is, is not viable right now for many, many of them. That includes, we had both diversified agriculture in Pune, which was a lot of orchards and vegetables. Uh, we also had quite a bit of papaya farming, and we also had quite a bit of orchid growing. I think we we're the certainly the papaya capital of the state, and possibly the orchid uh, capital of the state. Those well, the, I would think the I, orchids were sold all over the world, weren't? Aren't they? Well, they're Local. sold all over the world. The ones yeah. that are grown in Hawaii, I'd say a lot of them are grown in Pune District. So a lot of the people who lost their farms were orchid growers. Well, now tell me, is there a way for you as a senator to look at moving them to another location? The Big Island is big. Is there a way to redevelop in another location? Because they'll never go back. You know, the, bulk, the lava's just covered everything. So is there a way for you to move them to new development? I, I hate to say redevelopment, but a new development. Is that possible? Is there? It is possible, and I am trying to do that. I'm I'm working on a proposal to relocate both residences, residents, and farms. Uh, it, where they will go is still under discussion. My proposal is that we use a large section of state land, uh, which is unused, and we could relocate people to that in both a residential new village and also a new agricultural park, which, by the way, already had a proposal for an agricultural park in this same area. Starting a couple of years ago, it's moving slowly. If we have the will to fast track that, then we could settle a lot of farmers on land out there uh, quickly as a response to this disaster. I'm also working, the main thing I'm working on is long-term relocation for people who have been displaced. And I'm, I'm proposing the use of state land 
for that, although there are several other options of ways we could help people relocate, but it's important to me that we uh, develop a plan and begin to move on it soon because people really need a sense of hope. They need a sense of uh, light at the end of the tunnel and try to have a way of picturing what their life is like. I mentioned the loss of homes and I mentioned the loss of livelihood. And what's probably hard for people to understand is that there's a tremendous uh, mental stress in the community that's been affected. Um, it's some, some form of PTSD is affecting, in my opinion, thousands of people in Pune pretty much everybody that lost their home or was evacuated. So there's a, it, it's very, very stressful, and people need um, a sense that there's a way to move forward. So the biggest needs that we have here are A, short-term housing, and B, long-term housing. And I want to emphasize that these are not easy things to solve. But we're past the phase where we need food and water. We don't need that anymore. We don't need clothing and tents. What we need is housing. We need short-term housing to get people out of the very uncomfortable situations that they're in, either at the shelter or on someone's couch or garage. And then we need to move forward on a long-term relocation solution because that will take a while, and meanwhile, we're losing time. Well, I consider it urgent. It is urgent. Uh, even, you know, just watching, I can see the urgency. And I, I'm sure you're correct about the PTSD. Even those of us that are watching, it, it's, it hurts, you know. Just, just watching and knowing what the lava is doing. While I'm a fan of Madame Pele, it still hurts to see this to see what is happening to real people in real time. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me about the uh, geothermal plant. Now, what is oh, going oh, on with that good. thing? Well, it, has be, it was in the path of lava, and uh, it has been shut down, so it's not in operation. And beyond just being shut down, they took a lot of uh, precautionary steps to try to prevent hazards when when lava hits various parts of it. They've sealed the wells and sealed some of their equipment so that it would be safe if it gets inundated by lava. So right now it's offline. It has been offline since day two of the eruption, I think, and it's going to be offline for somewhere between months to years, if not forever, because, I mean, right now you can't even drive to the place. The electrical connections to it are all gone. The substations are gone. Some of their equipment is gone. Some of the wells are gone. It, it, so you can't even get equipment to it for oh, months at best. And we will have to move on in terms of our electrical grid to replace that electricity with other renewable energy. Uh, and I think that will have happened in the next year or so. I personally don't think they're ever going to reopen that plant because it's surrounded on three sides by hot, glowing lava. Now, even if the even if it should survive this eruption, I don't understand who's going to look at that picture and say, hmm, this looks like a safe place. Yeah, we have, we, we have a picture of that, and it doesn't look yeah. safe at all. So I can't believe they're ever going to try to re reopen that plant, but uh, that's a discussion for the future. Um, you know, the, the problems that geothermal is, is having in Hawaii are not political, they're geological and they can't be solved by discussion. It'll take them a very long time to figure out what to do. Well, we need to take a break, and we will be back in one minute. And then let's look at where we started, the future, and okay. um, other options. OK? Thank you, Marcia. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. They said I could play, so I ain't chance to play at all. You know, that's 
of my life. I love music. Yeah. I saw it. Aloha, welcome to Hawaii. This is Prince Dykes, your host of the Prince of Investing, coming to you guys each and every Tuesday at 11 a.m. right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Don't forget to come by and check out some of the great information on stocks, investings, your money, all the other great stuff, and I'll be your host. See you Tuesday. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey with Senator Russell Ruderman from the Big Island from the area of Puna. Is that District 2 or 1? Yes. Yes. And uh, it is almost. Now, how far are you from South Point? From South Point? Uh, maybe 30 miles, 40 miles, something like that. Yeah. Uh, a little bit more than that, I'm sorry. Let's say 50. That is the most southern point in the United States. Is that correct? Yes. So that's you're right. next. Well, you could say that, yeah. Yeah. Now, we want to talk about the future. Where do we go from here? How do you see this in all of the things that you said needed to be done? Step one, step two, step three. How do we move forward? And what is it that the rest of us can do to support your move forward? Now, of course, my one thing we talk about all the time on Cannabis Chronicles is hemp industry. Not, not marijuana, but hemp, growing hemp as an industry. And all okay. of the things that can come from that. And so where are you with this one? On the subject of hemp, you mean? Yes, as, as an industry. Yes, I'm all for it. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for uh, for us in Hawaii, and I think there'll be tremendous demand for Hawaiian uh, hemp products. And as you may know, some of the CBD oil and medicines are made from hemp, uh, and we could certainly make those kind of medicinal hemp products here. I think there's tremendous opportunities for us economically, medically, in terms of building materials, in terms of fuel. And even in terms of uh, seed, you know, we, are, we import all of our feed for chickens and stuff, and hemp could be a big boon for that. I'm very excited that we're going to get started with it finally. Yeah, well, uh, we have a picture of you with Senator Gabbard about uh -huh. hemp and the hemp. The way I see it, the way I'd like to see it, let me put it that way, as a hemp industry from seed to manufacture to export, when we have uh, it, this whole, I don't know what you call it, where children go away to school and don't come back. At least that's what my experience with all of my sons. And so if we go from seed to growing to manufacturing to export, we have a, an industry that our children can grow into. They can learn to be farmers manufacturers, scientists, engineers, all with this industry mm -hmm. so that they get to stay home. They don't have to go to California or Vegas or whatever. Yes, it has tremendous economic potential for our state. And um, I've been calling for its liberalization or legalization for many years. In fact, for several years, I and I will propose again next year, a bill that allows counties to regulate cannabis so that uh, if a county, for example, the Big Island, wants to have more liberal cannabis laws than the state has, I don't see why they shouldn't be allowed to uh, experiment with that. I know you're talking about hemp, and yes, there was just, you know, some moves have happened recently that makes hemp much more possible as a commercial crop, and I'm very excited about that. I think cannabis on both sides of the coin has tremendous potential for our society. Well, you're an environmentalist, and this is one of those little mm -hmm. things. Yes. That there's 27,000 real trees that go into making toilet paper just for the United States. 27,000 trees. Just think how many trees we could save if we used hemp to make toilet paper. Yeah. You know, there's just 
unimaginable that they're cutting down real, beautiful trees. I agree, and as a reminder, the reason hemp or cannabis is illegal was originally from money from the oil and timber industry. And so if we think about how much timber we wait, we cut, burned, or processed over the last 80 years, instead of hemp, which could have replaced it, and how much deforestation we've suffered, it's, it's an environmental crime um, uh, on a huge scale. And it's about time we reversed it, restored sanity to that. What well, you commented about the counties being able to regulate. Now, in 2000, in 2006, the Supreme Court said the states, they gave states rights. Now, that, you know, that hurts me to say states rights. But nonetheless, they said the states have a right to regulate their medical issues. So the state of Hawaii did that in 2002. So what is the holdup? I know that on the Big Island they're, they're growing seed to see what works best in Hawaii. So what's the holdup? The holdup was legal issues getting the first uh, crops in the ground. You know, I mean, I think there was issues with obtaining the seed legally, obtaining the licenses legally. And, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure what to say, Marcia, but I think that the holdups are mostly in the past. That's the good news. It has to do mostly with the federal uh, scheduling of any cannabis product as a Schedule One drug, and so you have to get special permission from DEA to import even hemp seeds, which is absurd, and, but that's the legal situation we have been in the last few years. I believe it's changing very fast right now, so on the hemp side, at least, there's good news. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm talking about hemp as an industry. Yeah. I understand. Now, of course, medical uh, cannabis is different. Do you have any dispensaries on the Big Island? Not that are open yet. Ours seem to be the last to open. There are two of them have a license to open, but they have not opened yet. So, no, the answer is no. No. And the, as big as the, the, the reason it's called a Big Island is because it's big, and only two dispensaries? Well, I'm sorry, to be clear, two companies got a license to open dispensaries. They each can open two, so that could lead to potentially four dispensaries on the Big Island. And uh, I don't think that that's our limiting factor. Uh, it's, it's a legal situation. And all, you know, when they did award legal medical dispensary licenses, I think they did it in a convoluted manner that made it much more difficult and much more expensive for the people who want to be in the legal medical dispensary business than what they should have done. I fear they've made it so expensive that the black market will continue to thrive instead and the legitimate dispensaries will have will struggle because of the expenses that have been put on them that are absurd. Well, now you're a senator, so you can go back and take a look at that, right? in this next session. Uh, you have... Well, theoretically, I mean, really, what half years ago, the legislature passed a bill saying that, asking the Department of Health to make medical marijuana available through dispensaries. We passed a fairly clear bill with a statement of intent, and it somehow got convoluted to say that, well, we're going to make it as difficult as possible, pretty much, and we're going to make the... Uh, the way the ways people really want to take it, which is smoking or eating, we're going to make that as difficult as possible. So I, I think a bureaucracy got in the way of our legislative intent in the process of drafting rules and made it much more difficult, much more limited, and much more expensive than it ought to have been. Well, now the Department of Health is in the governor's office, and can they just run amok like that? It, you know, I don't want to say you? that they're running amok. I think there's good people being uh, each each responding from their own point of view. But the net result is a perversion of what the legislative intent was. We wanted it to be available safely, and instead it's not available, and it's expensive and inconvenient. It is, 
And I'm still, you know, amazed, like I said, as big as the Big Island is, and you only have two. Now, in the little bit of time we le left, everything in Pune is upset, or almost. What about rural health? What about the health of these people? Do, are there facilities that are outside of that area? Um, hospitals, clinics, whatever, to assist? Because you, you talked about PTSD. What? Well, there's, there's some non-government agencies, you know, charitable agencies that are trying to be involved. And, of course, you know, we have, I mean, we have a hospital in Hilo, but Pune, you know, which I repeat is the size of Oahu, doesn't have a hospital or an emergency room or psychiatric office. We don't have any of the basic services that almost every other district in our state has. Uh, and so we're lacking profoundly in basic services, and we, our whole island has a shortage of mental health uh, professionals. So it's, of course, much worse in Pune, where we don't have any offices. But, but we have a lack of all those kinds of services. When I get on the plane Monday morning, if I'm going to Oahu for business, I see a bunch of acquaintances and friends. Almost all of them are traveling to Oahu to see a medical specialist, because we don't have those services on the Big Island. Well, okay. So then, at the opening of the legislature, that should be number one, rural health. It really needs to be, not just Puna, but even when you get out of um, urban Honolulu, when you get out further, uh, that's an issue. So I am asking you to please make that a priority, rural health across the state. It's this, this modern day, we have to do better than this. We must do better than this. Thank you. It's a priority for me. Thank you. Thank you, and count on it. We'll support whatever you want when it comes to rural health. And I promised you we would end on time, and you will come back, and let's talk more about rural health and how we can help. Thank okay, thank you very much, Marcia. Thank you, you so me. much. Yeah, Aloha. Yeah,